there in a minute. <laughs> this way, Joe. Yeah. It's really, you'd be surprised how many movies that happens to. It's not 
a unique situation. It's kind of shocking, actually. And the new one really is actually the more likely to see a law. There's, I fly a lot international, so I'm on the plane for 10 to 14 hours, and uh, I'm always amazed how many movies I find where I go, what the fuck? I mean, the big stars and sometimes big, I mean, big names that you go, I never heard of this movie. And you see it on an airplane. But it's, it's, an it's a crazy thing. Yeah. So tell me about shooting, shooting in 3D, why you wanted to shoot in 3D, how you enjoyed the experience, and tell me all about 3D. Well, I, 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 I grew up in the 50s, and there were a lot of 3D movies for a brief period, and I saw a lot of them. And one of my first movies I ever saw was a game out of space, and it was in 3D, mm -hmm. and it made a big impression on me. Uh, one of the best 3D movies I ever saw was uh, Dime One from Murder, which is actually a stage play, but it's uh, shot. Did you, when did you see it in 3D? Because it wasn't released in 3D. I saw it after the, oh, the wait. Tiffany, at the Tiffany. Um, remember the Tiffany? Yes. Yeah. The World, three three movies for a dollar. No, of course it's like that. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it, that movie uses 3D in interesting ways because it uses it psychologically and it uses it dramatically. And it's not just throwing things use 3D correctly, you can, you can actually add an emotional layer to the picture because it does make you feel like you're in the movie, in the room, in the place. And uh, because this was such a claustrophobic movie, I thought it would be interesting to be able to, uh, to present it in a way that it has depth. And we actually uh, won an award at the Venice Film Festival, the first award they ever gave for 3D movies. This, this picture won an award because it still didn't get it booked. <laughs> Did it play at the Venice? Yeah, no, it was very popular. And in yeah. Toronto? I said Toronto, but I think, but I think in Toronto there was a fire, uh, a fire alarm going off in the middle oh. of the picture. And so a lot of people didn't see me. And I think, you know what, we're, I mean, I thought the 3D was most interesting was in the surreal stuff. Uh, when he goes in the hole and his father, he's dealing with his father and the place is falling apart. I thought the 3D was great. The, 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 the worry on the part of the producers was that uh, the, the script is a little darker than it appeared to be because it's ultimately about child abuse uh, and it's somewhat in the, in the, vein, yeah. in the vein of The Shining uh, and, and Death, of course. Um, but, you know, the, the idea of these pictures is they're supposed to be for families. It's like horror pictures with kids in them are supposed to be movies that, are, that you, know, you bring the whole family to. And there was some concern about how, how grim the idea could be about what this guy was doing with his kids. And so it was a, it was a sort of a fine line that we walked. But it, in, in the end, it didn't matter because nobody saw it. <laughs> what was interesting to me was that exact sitting here thinking, well, what, how were they just thinking, what was it, PG or PG-13? Uh, PG-13. PG-13? It was like, how do you, who are you selling this movie to? Just as an exploitation thing, it's, it's kind of, I mean, there are moments that's too scary. Too, the, was that stop motion with the puppet or just puppetry? I was just puppetry. Even when he was like running across the floor. That was cool. <laughs> also, there's a creepy little girl in it who is played by a little boy, which is uh, something I stole from uh, Fellini and Mario Bava because they had these creepy, you know, uh, little girl characters always played with by little boys and we. And, um, Except for the cut. Have you ever seen Never Bet the Devil in Your Head or Toby Dammit? Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's really great. Yeah. It's a Bellini. It's great. But also we wanted to try to find a way to make her seem creepy. So we, what we ended up doing was shooting her backward, having her walk backward, and then printing it with, with a sort of step printing thing, which like dropped a frame or something out of it. It just made it seem jerky and weird. And, and it was not, a, not an effect I'd seen anywhere else, but it worked okay. It kind of, you know, those people crawling into the hole kind of reminded me of uh, whatever it's called when she crawls into the TV. The ring. The ring. The ring. Same kind of. Ringo. Ringo. Which is better than the ring. <laughs> but so, okay, what else do you want me to ask, Joe? I really don't. Uh, <laughs> I can tell you that my son Max saw Gremlins 2. I brought the laser disc home. And I think he saw it 46,000 times. <laughs> and that means I have a lot to answer.
<laughs> no, but I'm, I'm just like gremlins to be burned into my psyche. He's completely psychotic. And, and also, you know, it was a problem. I know that you always wince or something with explorers. You always had some yeah, misgiving. I just went to see. But I can't. Have you ever seen explorers? Yeah. yeah. Because you see, once they get on the alien spacecraft, that 15 minutes? How long is that? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, 20 minutes is great! Yeah. <laughs> Sunk the movie. <laughs> Did, why? People didn't like it? I love they, it. They, they were, they were, the rest of the movie looks still for you. And the kids in the movie are like looking for the answer to their the, the riddles of the universe. And when they get to the planet and they discover that just kids like them, you know, quoting pop culture back to them, which I thought was interesting, uh, the audience was just as disappointed as the kids. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, do you, are you serious? Do you really uh, believe that? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it was so brilliant. And Picardo was brilliant. No, he was great. And, every, and one of my favorite shots in it, there was another one, Max saw 70 million times. But one of the things, it, it, there's like little Richard screaming on the soundtrack and they're dancing and all the stuff's going on in total insanity. And you just cut to a wide shot in outer space with the ship and you just hear the music from the <laughs> quiet from the ship's one of my favorite things. Anyway, um, okay, what else do you want to know? You know, I have to tell you that I was just in New Zealand, and Peter Jackson told me that he will never shoot 3D again because, because I just had the experience of turning an old movie and with conversion, making it 3D, and now that technology is perfect, and you can actually do better 3D than shooting it 3D. Although the problem was, you know. If I had known that, you would have composed them for three days, which I didn't do. But still, it's it's an amazing process. Yes. Um, no questions, but two movies in particular, um, and now my kids have discovered. The longest day in Ben Hur. Yes. No. They they fell in love with explorers, and I I don't know why. I mean, I don't know. It's, it, it's a I don't know why he wins, but. No, I went because the picture was released unfinished, and I, I, it was a rough cut, and oh. let me finish the movie. So okay. I, for me, it's a little bit of a sore spot, but there's a lovely thing there. Uh, they, they, they really they fell in love with it, yeah. yeah. Why no, would kids they, like it. Why would they? Well, because they changed administrations. The, 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 uh, the administration of Paramount left and went to Disney and left me with Frank Mike Kuko, uh, the, the marketing guy, and he just took the, set, took the entire slate of pictures that these guys had in production, and he, they said, jump, jump these. Just stop right now, don't work, don't spend any more money, finish them and put them out. And then they proceeded to you know, make sure that they didn't make any money so nobody could say, well, look, the prior regime made pictures that made money. So it was, a, a, I've known Sherlock Holmes and Arrow and uh, Young uh, the Lady something or other. I mean, the, all those pictures just were, they just wanted to be either, for a whole year in 1985, the year of the pictures that Paramount gave up on. And you did, so you weren't even allowed to what, what did you have left to do? You shot it. I, I was, I was, I, I had a preview of my run cut, but, the, but and then they, they just said finish it, and I said, but, but, and, and it was two months before the schedule, my schedule date, and and I and at the time Peter Bogdanovich was, was being sued by uh, Universal for Mask, which had a similar problem, and that it had been taken away from, him. and he was he was getting a lot of bad press, and, and it was like, do I do Dante sues Paramount? I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think that. Do my, because I was part of that, that they didn't take it away from him. He wanted a piece of music. He sued him. Because he wanted to be, Peter wanted a piece, he wanted a couple of needle drop songs. By the way, Mask is a really good movie. And they, they said, well, no, the songs were like a million dollars a piece. And they said, no, replace them. And he refused. And it was supposed to scream at Cain. And Peter refused to compromise. And they said, well, sorry. He, they didn't cut it. They didn't take it away. They said, replace those two pieces of music. And he refused. He also, I was in London at the time, published a full-page ad variety saying, 
Universal is fucking with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And here people support me. And he put my uh, my name on it. <laughs> and all kinds of people on it. And most of whom he didn't ask. We were supporting him. But what was interesting about it was the studio said, fuck you, we're showing it again. Because Cher said she'd show up. And they replaced, I don't know who did it, but someone chose music. They showed it again. Gigantic hit. Cher gets best actress at can. The movie's really good movie was a hit. And to this day, Peter talks about, I fucked me, you know. <laughs> they didn't recut it. It's his movie. I don't, you know, he, I don't understand. <laughs> Any other non madonna it's really <laughs> The reason they sued him was to show it at can. And they won, by the way. I'm here. Joe. Go for it. Chris Columbus has been developing Gremlins 3 for longer than, than your, your Aunt Minnie has been baking pie. <laughs> uh, I, whether anything will ever come of it, I have no idea. I have no idea what techniques they're going to use or, how, or what they're going to do. It just is that completely out of my hands. Yeah, when you hear stuff like that, like so many people have said to me, hey, that's so great, you're making a sequel to Coming to America. No, I'm not. And their mom has announced it. I know nothing about it. Yeah. These people don't have to go back to you, you know, when they make it. You know, yeah, if you're the director, it's... No, you have to be the producer. Or, or the writer. Or the writer. Because you have the underlying right. Yes. Watching the whole, um, it was really fascinating the way the film reflects a lot of films from the past, like Dr. Caligari. It even reminded me of, like, Orson Welles' The Trial. How much does your love for film history influence like the Orlock Globe Factory. Well, that's just that's just a joking reference, but uh, it's not conscious. It's just my my. I've seen a lot of movies. They're all up in my head. Uh, they come out when appropriate, and sometimes when inappropriate. Uh, and um, that's why you see echoes of other people's stuff in my in my movies. It's just my, that's part of my background. That's not entirely true. Some of it's subconscious, but a lot of it is Joe doing. You know, like an homage kind of thing. Some countries are unconscious. Or unconscious, that's true. Yes. Yeah, um, I just wanted you to know, because you, you know, talk about the movie, this is the third and two thirds time that I've seen it in the theater. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why that's why see. I see the two thirds, because of the Ryerson and the fire alarm in the Toronto. Oh, you were there? I was there. I that was pretty exciting. At what point did the fire alarm go off? Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Did people have to leave the theater? Yes. And that was it? And then we came back and they said, we can't finish the movie because it would mess up everybody else's schedule, too. So it's I like, wonder who pulled the fire. They have it. Actually, a 3D show here in L.A., downtown, some place. And then uh, tonight. But I actually also... Bought the Chinese version of the DVD, uh, uh, Blu-ray, no, for the English one. So the American film. I, obviously, I love this movie, and just FYI, since you said you didn't know what Nathan was up to, he uh, a couple of months ago DJed uh, Chris Masoli's wedding. Yeah, and he's oh really? Oh yes, I did see that Chris got married. I saw a picture of him and his wife. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and he's up in school somewhere. Else. Oh, that's great. They were there. Good kids. I like you. Well, it's like, it's like being a dad for, uh, you know, six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, keeping on our theme of uh, Untold Horror, and you guys touched a little bit about projects that you're not involved with and some of the frustrations. Um, you guys have worked together and been friends for a long time, and I would love to hear you guys talk about the whole Creature from the Black Lagoon Jaws 3 thing that went down because it's a fantastic story. Can you tell us a little bit about... Well, Jaws 3 and Creature Back are separate stories. Well, they're, they're actually, that we were both screwed by the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> Which is... Universal. <laughs> Sid Scheinberg, actually. Yeah. Joe was developing Jaws 3, People 
zero <laughs> for National Lampoon and Universal. And that was, and tell them who you cast before 10. Oh, it was Bo Derrick. <laughs> it had Bo Derrick in it before people knew who she was. But the problem was that um, uh, yeah, John Hughes actually wrote the script, uh, one of the writers. And um, the, the problem was that the, it was Anakin and Brown who were the Jaws people, and Maggie Simmons, who was the National Lampoon person, uh, did not see eye to eye on what kind of a comedy this was supposed to be. And obviously, the National Lampoon wanted it to be raunchy, and the, the uh, David Brown and Maddox, who were a little more staid, wanted it to be. They didn't want to mess up their franchise, they didn't want to poop on it. So, uh, there was a lot of tension, and I remember being in a, a meeting with Ed Tan, and this was my first studio movie. I'm, I'm the kid from Roger Corman who just like called in to do this picture, and they handed me storyboards that were already drawn without a beat, <laughs> and they're all from high level at like Universal Television. Uh, and I remember thinking, geez, I'm not going to have any input on this movie at all. So that they, there was a big blowout between Zanuck and Brown and Maddie Simmons in Ed Tan's office, and they both, and they stormed out, and I was left with Ned. It was quite a character. And Ned looked at me and said, well, kid, your picture just walked out the door. <laughs> and I was producing a remake of The Creature from the Black Lagoon that was to be directed by Jack Arnold and had a screenplay by Nigel Neal. And were you, was that, was The Creature? Was backup director. Yeah, and so I wanted Jack to direct it. He wasn't that young, but he was fine. Jack had a wooden leg, and so they were saying, well, you know, what if he dies? What if he trips? What if he <laughs> so Joe was the backup director at that point. But we shot a 3D test in uh, Steven Spielberg's swimming pool, actually. With, De I've never forgot, Deborah Jo Fonda, who was Playmate of the Year. Long lost there, swimming back and forth, naked, of course. And we had a very bullshit creature just shooting tests, but with Robert Skotak, by the way. And what was, this is before digital, and what was so amazing was the test was fantastic. I mean, it was nothing but just a person, you know, a creature, so-called, swimming under the snake girls moving back and forth. But I still think Creeps from the Black Lagoon, if you see it projected correctly, is some of the best 3D you'll ever see. And I thought it was so cool, and I said, I would like to show this, you know. So I showed it to uh, Ned Tan, and he wanted to show it to Sid Schoenberg and Lou Wasserman, because he said, we're not making 3D movies. Theaters are going, do you know why 3D died, by the way? It's very interesting. It, no, it, it died because you needed two projectors. All movie theaters used to have two projectors. Put a reel on, and remember when you'd see the cigarette burns? That was the signal for the projectionist to change to the next reel, the next projector, and you'd have a changeover. And then he'd thread the other projector. Platters. When you threw, this before the platters. <laughs> when you see 3D, they had to use two projectors mm -hmm. to do it. They had to be in perfect sync. Of course, they were never in perfect sync. And they had to be in intermission because they, they... Did you know all 3D movies had an intermission between reels? Because the intermission was, it enabled them to be able to load up the other two projectors. But, but John is right. The, the, the difficulty with 3D projection and was that to get it aligned correctly uh, is, is very important because otherwise you get ice cream. So when they would release a 3D movie in Los Angeles and New York, and maybe Boston or Chicago or some of the bigger markets, you'd see it first run and it would look good. But once it went wide and to out there, people would get headaches. Yeah. And also, if there was a splice in one print, yeah, and you yeah. didn't make a splice in the other print, then you'd be one frame out of sync in the 3D for the entire show. So it was a logistical nightmare, and that's what, what killed me. It's actually me. amazing that it lasted as long as Yeah. And so, interestingly enough, digital now is perfect. It's perfect sync. I mean, you know, it's a it's a DCP, and the 3D is perfect, and it's not going to give you a headache, and it's not going to fuck you up. It's very interesting. <laughs> and now that they finally have it right, of course, it's a gimmick to make you pay more money. It's not necessarily something that enhances the movie. <laughs> anyway, yes. Well, yeah. you guys are two very accomplished directors, and I think you still have pull enough
to make 3D movies and help them come back. That's because you're naive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm reverent. You're not reverent, you're naive. People are always thinking, I'll give it to John Landis, he'll get it. He can get it made. No, we're not. That's not the case. It's not the case. I wish. Well, what do you think is going to happen with 3D with... Uh, is James Cameron going to once again come out with his avatar to make it big again and everyone's going to jump on the bad way? No, you know, it's going to come out and it's going to be big, but I don't think everybody's going to jump back on the bad way. I mean, look, every, every cartoon, every, every uh, animated uh, you know, CGI uh, picture is, is in 3D. Because it's very simple to push the button and it's hard to do it. Uh, and so that's a, that's, that's a given. They can just do that because it's easy. And, uh, and, and I think probably even now that, uh, as John says, it's, it's Technology has gotten so much better to, to post. -play. The last three Marvel movies, you know how they always release it 3D and then they release it flat? And it, it, they would be in some, you could see it 3D or flat. The last three Marvel movies, the flat versions, tripled the income of the 3D version. Mm -hmm. So it's just, what? It's just, it's, it's actually getting simpler and simpler. And as I said, conversion now is amazing. Sitting, you know, and, and Peter's right. Peter Jackman's right. There's no reason to actually go through what Joe went through with all those films. My favorite thing is the most successful 3D movie in the first 3D craze in the 50s, which was House of Wax, directed by a one-eyed man. <laughs> <laughs> and great at all. Yes. Not really. I'm, I'm, I've, I wanted to make a 3D movie. I made a 3D movie. If I make another movie in 3D, I, I would plan it to be in 3D. I don't think the movies that I did before were ever planned to, make, to be in 3D. I'm, they might look okay, they might look interesting, but it, it's really a shot by shot. And is editing in 3D is not the same as editing in flat because your eye, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't suddenly do something to somebody's eyeball and make them have to suddenly convert from here to here. Without thinking about that, and and so you, you, have, you it's it's very kind of martial art you edit the movie as you're editing synthetic, but it's not it's not like it's not like normal editing. It, it, everything is a little heightened, especially with martial. <laughs> Except that it was a low budget film, and I did all the editing in 2D. I never saw it in 3D. I never saw the dailies in 3D or in, they did up in Vancouver. When you finally saw it in 3D, are there cuts you would have done different? Yes. <laughs> A few. How do you do that? Well, you can't. You can't go back and change it. Yeah, I don't know. But um, the, I agree with Joe, no, because there wasn't anything, unless you plan it. In Thriller, which was interesting, there are four, it, it looks, the real reason I did it was to get access to the negative, so I could restore it. There's a this little known fact, which is that my deal with the Michael Jackson people and it was that we released theatrically. And it was, did we made a deal with Disney and it was with Fantasia for three weeks. Unfortunately, when they saw the reaction to that, and I didn't know until a few years ago who did it. I know now. He's dead, unfortunately, but Frank DeLeo, who was Michael's manager at the time, did it. The motherfucker. And what happened, <laughs> what happened was very good for Michael and very good for the record company, but fuck me completely, which is that he made a dupe of Thriller. He made 10,000 dupes of Thriller. Sent them to every television station in the world and said, here, free. So, I, I, I don't know if you, you're too young, but if you remember, there was a time where it was all thriller all the time. It was like, it's a wonderful life. Everyone had it for free, you know. <laughs> so it was always shown. But they're dudes. They look like shit. It drives me crazy. Even if you look at thriller on YouTube, like official one, it's shitty looking. It's gorgeously photographed by Robert Payne. So I was anxious to get to the negative and show you, because I've got like two 35 millimeter prints that are gorgeous, but 
by making it 3D, I could, I could, you know, make it perfect. And boy, it's gorgeous. And interestingly enough, it's cool in 3D. A couple of the monster stuff, you know, like when he girls on the ground, and he goes, that's pretty cool in 3D. That's also why I made that hand go into the theater, you know. But the most impressive thing is the dance number is 70% better in 3D, even though I didn't, like, when I did it, I didn't think 3D, 3D. It's just the way they're arranged is perfect for 3D, and it makes it so much, it's incredible, it really makes it much better. But I agree with Joe, no, unless you're going to plan it, there's no reason to do it. So did the 3D kill the creature ultimately? How? Oh, so I didn't finish the story. So, so Ned goes, okay, let's sew it. So here's Lou and Sid. We show them the test, which is a minute and a half. Sid says, show me that again. They show it to him again. And he goes, this is fantastic. This is amazing. You know, fuck the creature from the Black Lagoon. And fuck Jaws 3 People Zero. It's Jaws 3D. <laughs> and then... They actually made Jaws 3D, and they used the cheaper system. They didn't even use the good frame. It's the over under and drum and done it. This is uh, really a like, 216 mm for So, yes. My favorite horror movies are werewolf movies. Now, both of your films were released in 1981. Were you guys friends then, and did you know that you were each doing? The Howling and American Werewolf in London. We were London. friends until we found out we were making music. <laughs> <laughs> I actually found out only because um, I had been trying to make the American Werewolf in London since 1969. And I only found, when I finally, after years and years in 1981, made a deal on Werewolf, I immediately called Rick Baker, who I'd given the script in 1971. I said, Rick, guess what? We're going to make Werewolf. And he was like, <laughs> what? Why do you think so weird? He said, well, I'm kind of, like, I'm kind of making the werewolf. <laughs> and I was like, what? And it turned out that he was working, he was doing the howling. And they were in pre-production, and so I proceeded to, like, get very angry. I said, you didn't show him the Chancho heads that we developed in the 70s. Well, I'm like, you motherfucker. So what ended up was Rick's assistant at the time was Rob Botin. So Rick left the howling. Rob did the howling. Rob is a genius, so I think that Joe turned out okay. And then I made Werewolf. And I think I made Werewolf after that. I'm not even sure. Right. After, like, right after we were in London. So the howling was finished. Uh, but in 1980, but it wasn't released until 1981. Oh, I, didn't know. Yeah, released in Europe. I remember when I saw The Howling, there's a scene in The Howling that I think is so creepy, which is the when she's in that like porno booth and the, mm -hmm. the rape, you're watching the rape and the werewolf is it. That's a really creepy scene. That's really creepy. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? Then he had that poodle in. Wait a minute. And the happy face. Yes. How, how, when, when you guys were in your careers, when you were uh, reading scripts, what were you? Uh, what stood out in a script and a screenplay to you that would uh, be something that you would want to make? Something that we get made would be good. Um, <laughs> you know, we 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 did what we were told. I mean, when you start out, you do what they give you and what they let you do. Uh, and I was lucky enough to get to do things that were in the genre that I like. And, uh, I mean, I certainly would have made a Piranha movie if somebody had said, we're going to make a Piranha movie, you want to do it? Because right now, uh, nobody else knows me. I think you're all doing Piranha movies. Um, but then, you know, once you've had a couple of pictures that did, did well, then you can be more choosy about what you're going to do. And you can, you know. I remember when Joe made Gremlin, because I was aware of the gossip and stuff. The first one, it's like, Warner Brothers didn't like it. But no one was excited about it at all. And when I saw it, I was amazed that he made such an original and good movie with a, a studio that clearly had no fucking idea what you know. But that was to make Steve Spielberg happy because you know he, Spielberg wanted to do it. It was his first Amblin picture, and uh, the studio wanted to keep him happy because he had an office on a lot and he was working all the time at Universal. 
and not at Warner Brothers. And it's like, well, yeah, we gotta have Spielberg work for us. So they said, well, let, this is Spielberg's folly. We'll let him do this, and you know, it'll, it'll come and go, and it'll be fine, and then he'll make big money pictures for us and everything. And then, luckily, because they weren't paying attention, it turned out to be good. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they were genuinely surprised. They were, they were shocked. It's a huge success, that movie. They were all going, that's what we meant, Joe. <laughs> when we were giving you shit, that's really what we meant. Joe, when they were marketing that movie, it was presented at Steven Spielberg Presents, and it didn't mention your name at all. Did you feel bad? Were you like, hey, I put up my heart and everything into this movie? No, nobody's going to come to the movie because Joe Dante presents. <laughs> Not <laughs> then. Or I'd only done a couple of pictures. And, uh, you know, it was, it was the Spielberg uh, name that, that got attention. I mean, I don't, I don't think it a lot of people who went to see it thinking it was a Spielberg movie were, were annoyed that this is, this, is, this is different than what they expected. But then there were other people who, who, who went anyway, despite the fact that it was a Spielberg movie and liked it. And, uh, who can let them? The same movie could have come out six months earlier, six months later, and, and done nothing. I mean, it was the right movie at the right time, and we're all lucky when we get one of those. Well, that's true. The zeitgeist has everything to do with the success of a movie. Really bad movies are big hits all the time. <laughs> and really good movies fail all the time. And and what I've had in my career, in fact, Joe has too. Joe actually has got better reviews than me usually. But we both are old enough now. I have, I've made a lot of movies that were shit on <laughs> by the critics that are now referred to as classic films <laughs> and held up as role models. And they're the same movies that they they hate it. But that's also because the people who hated them were older. And, uh, a lot of the same people. But, but, but the younger people saw the pictures, and, and many of them who didn't see them in theaters saw them on the home video and passed them around to their friends and all that. And that's, that's how a picture like The Birds, which you know, didn't exactly set the world on fire when it was new, has now become this movie that people quote, and everybody you know, sees it over and over, and they have parties and all that kind of stuff. That, that couldn't happen based they on have the bird party. The verb website, it's, it's really bizarre. <laughs> yes? Um, I have a, a question. Since you you guess it's you? Yeah. Don't guess, it is you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we were talking about 3D, uh, and you also mentioned Peter Jackson. I remember when one of the Hobbit movies came out in like an advanced frame rate of 48 frames, and then subsequent film is doing the 18 per IMAX. I'm wondering what your thinking is about uh, these different technologies beyond just the regular you know, 24 frames, the stuff we're used to. Well, well I saw Ang Lee's uh, movie about the guy who walks from home plate, or whatever the title was. Billy, <laughs> Billy, somebody goes to. Right. Yeah, Billy Lynn. Billy Lynn walks from uh, which I, which I, I like the movie, but I saw it in the, in the new million frame rate, whatever. Uh, and I thought it was interesting, but the problem with all of those uh, things is that after about 20 minutes, you just get used to it. And you don't pay attention to the fact that it looks different. That's one of the reasons the show scan didn't work. Uh, is because after a while, it's just not special anymore. And, and Douglas Trumbull tried to compensate for that when he made Brainstorm by having a plan to have show scan scenes interspersed with 35 millimeter scenes so that then you go back to show scan and you go, oh, look, that is better. Oh, yes, we like that. Uh, that. He wasn't able to do that, but that was the thinking behind it. And I, I just think that a lot of these things are great, but uh, they're not the be all and all. I, mean, I think some of them are not great. Peter, you know that Frank Gray thing you're talking about. I was amazed when I saw it because that level of clarity he was talking and the way the light worked, I, you know, this new process makes the sets that look so good in Lord of the Rings look like shit. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, it's like, have you ever seen an old Hollywood movie on TV in, in PAL? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, when they do the big, they, you know, it's European television, when they get the clarity too high, it looks like it was shot in videotape. Mm -hmm. Could be three strip technicolor, it looks like videotape. It's a strange thing. But digital is now, I hate to say, perfect. And uh, I'm going to get only better. And I also said, here's the only thing I have to tell you other than Joe is brilliant, is go see Roma and go see it in the theater 
because it's true, truly great. And when I saw it with my wife the other day, big, um, I thought, what a crime that this will be seen on Netflix to pay for it. So, but they're only putting it in the theater to qualify for an Oscar. It's huge cinemascope, gorgeous black and white photography. And when it was over, I turned to Deborah and I had this epiphany, which is, I was born in 1950. So, like Joe, we're children of the 50s and 60s, which means I used to go to the movies and people like Hitchcock, Truffaut, Godard, Fellini, Bergman, David Lean, you know, I mean, Sidney Lovett, I mean, so many great filmmakers and so many great films came out. You know, from Disney or from whoever it likes. I mean, from all over the world. You had Kurosawa was making pictures. I mean, you go to the movies and you often see a movie by David Lean or something. When I saw Roma, when it was finished, I took it and I said, you know, I can't remember the last time I saw a truly great film like this. I've seen lots of movies I liked and lots of good movies, but this is one for the ages. You know, you heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, but anyway, anything else for Joe about his entire career? Uh, no. Can you can you talk about Javier Navarrete as a choice? Uh, Javier was, look, I have to replace Jerry Goldsmith with somebody, and uh, I had seen Pan Labyrinth and loved the music, and I uh, talked to Guillermo about it, and uh, Javier was available, and uh, I really found him uh, a wonderful guy. Unfortunately, he had to record the music in, where was it? Slow, slow, slow back Slovenia or something, Slovenia. and we had to do it. And because of that, we had to do it in the middle of the night when it was daytime over there. So all we and we, we didn't we couldn't afford to go because it wasn't very expensive for movie. So uh, we would we would we would go to this room in the middle of the night, starting at midnight, and we would just watch on video and listen to him doing the score. Uh, and you know, and what what I found most annoying was that one of the producers. Uh, the guy who headed the company fancied himself a musician or a music buff. Yeah. He started telling Javier how to uh, how to write the music while he was on the set, on the stage conducting. Mm -hmm. And I, it was I, I, at one point I had to just leave the room and just say, you, "Okay, guys, just you do it. So you, you write the music, you record it. Because you can do it without me." And it was it was really disrespectful. Mm -hmm. There's the old Hollywood jokes. And there are many old Hollywood jokes from the 20s and 30s, and they're all still great. <laughs> and one of my favorites, which I'm sure you've heard variations of, but speaks to Joe's story, which is, uh, and this joke literally is Paramount Commissary 1930. I mean, that's how long, but the joke is a writer, a producer, and a director are driving a car to the desert. This is so <laughs> so, 1930, that's what I said. They're driving a car in the desert, and it's unbelievably hot. It's well over 100 degrees. And they run out of gas. And they're in the middle of nowhere. And there's nowhere, I mean, they figure, well, some. No, after a couple of hours, they realize they're about, they're going to die. And they better do something. So they start to walk. And they're walking, and the sun is down and it's like 110 and they're hours walking in this heat with no shade, nothing, and they're really on their last legs. <laughs> one, one thing he does well is telling jokes. <laughs> one thing he does well is fuck it up. <laughs> anyway, they're walking and walking and the sun is beating down and they're on their last legs when the writer says, Look. And the producer and director look. What? And the writer says, there, on, on that ridge, there's something shiny, something glitting. There's, there's something there. And the director runs up the side of the hill, and he looks, and behind the rock, he finds a can of cold, and he reads it, a fresh orange juice. And he says, let's drink it. And he opens it, and the producer says, wait. I have to piss at it first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.